Hi everyone, I am Marianne from Cultivate Communications. I want to welcome you to our webinar, Become a Market Trend Spotter. We have a very special guest today, Mr. Mark Schaefer. He's a futurist and author of many marketing books. He is going to help us to understand how to become a trend spotter. So this time of year, we're all keeping an eye open for the trends that various experts are sharing with us. We're taking it a step further and helping you to identify ways to uh, see trends that are going to be especially impactful for your business. So let's jump in. Hey, Mark, welcome. Well, thank you, Marianne. It's a pleasure to be here today and co-present this webinar with Cultivate Communications. I think it's going to be quite interesting and scintillating. It's certainly a topic that I think is relevant to everyone, how to become a marketing trend spotter today. So what I'm going to do is talk about some of the big ideas from a new book I wrote called Cumulative Advantage. It's about building momentum. And I think this is extremely important now to get some of these ideas about how does momentum really work? Now, we won't be able to cover everything in the book today, but I want to cover some very high level ideas, including why is this important now? Why now? Why is trend spotting important to creating momentum? How do you do it? I'm going to give you some actionable tips. And then at the end, I'll actually give you some trends that I'm watching that could be relevant to you in the marketing field. So let's go ahead and get started. And right off the bat, I am going to save you so much time and so much money because I'm going to tell you the theme of every marketing book written in the last 10 years and probably the theme of every book written in the next 10 years, whether it's communications or SEO or social media, content marketing. Everybody's looking at the same thing and it's this. How can we be heard? It's really hard. Maybe you're thinking about that for your own business right now. It seems to be overwhelming and you've possibly seen a lot of these statistics that point to why. The world is simply being over flooded over flooded. That's a new word I just invented. It's being flooded, <laughs> maybe overly over flooded with an incredible amount of information, it's just like a tsunami, right? All of this is trying to get people's attention. You can see the number of posts on WordPress. You've seen all the statistics on YouTube. And the more content get, that gets out there, the harder it is to compete. Now, this fellow right here was a guy named Jimmy Nicholson, he, it, last year, he was the number one YouTube star. He goes by Mr. Beast. Doesn't really look like Mr. Beast to me. He looks like maybe Mr. Accountant or something, but we won't judge. If he wants to be Mr. Beast, so be it. Now, this guy made tens of millions of dollars on YouTube last year. He spent, on average, $300,000 per video to stand out on YouTube. Some of his videos cost a million dollars. Now, if you have that kind of budget, please contact me after this presentation. I think there might be some things we can do together. So this is why this idea of momentum is so important. If you don't have those kind of resources, if you're feeling like you're kind of stuck, where do you turn? How do you get to the next level? Now, I became obsessed with this idea. And I spent about two years researching and writing this book that I mentioned, Cumulative Advantage. And my research led me to this man. His name is Robert Merton. He is one of the most famous sociologists who ever lived. Chances are you've never heard of him because let's be honest, how many people can name any famous sociologist? But he actually created a lot of the ideas we use today in marketing, in social media, in content. And one of the most important was this idea called cumulative advantage. When he was a university professor, 
his students were complaining that they were doing all the work and the famous professors were taking credit for their work, writing all these papers that made them more successful and more famous, bigger offices, bigger resources, while they just kept getting poorer. And he's, so he did this research, very famous research, came up with this idea called the Matthew effect, which later became called cumulative advantage. And it goes something like this. Once a person gains a small advantage over others, that advantage will compound over time into an increasingly larger advantage. Now, in the world of sociology, one of the most common examples they use to illustrate this is a bank account. Let's say all things being equal, someone starts out with $1,000 in their bank account, another person has $10,000 in their bank account, they both get a 5% interest rate. Of course, at the beginning, the difference is $9,000. But over 10 years, that expands to almost $15,000 and the gap will never close. So it's this idea that once you have this momentum, the gap between you and your competitors keeps increasing. But it's not just about money. It's about any advantage you have in your life and your career. This has been studied in the world of sociology and proven in things like sports. They did a study, for example, that showed that when children get early coaching, when they reach the major sports leagues, their career lasts longer and they make more money. In education, children who get early advantages in terms of being able to read at an early age have a much more successful uh, track record in college and academia and even health. It showed that when children are in poverty, they're not getting enough to eat, they're not getting enough sleep and nutrition, maybe they live in fear. When they get adopted into a safe and healthy environment, their average IQ raises from 77 to 92. Just the advantage of being safe and a safe advantage can create momentum. This has been proven at the Oscars in entertainment, even in tech. How did Bill Gates become Bill Gates? It wasn't because he was wealthy. It wasn't because he had a Harvard degree. When he was a teenager, he had access to early computer types. He was coding before anybody else. That was his initial advantage. Now, let's dive into this a little bit more. This momentum begins with some sort of initial advantage. So what does that really mean? I'd like you to think about something right now. I want you to think about where you were in your career five years ago, or maybe 10 years ago, and compare that to where you are now. Did your progress occur because you had a plan all those years ago? Did you have a vision all those years ago? Or did something random happen that kind of led you to where you are now? Maybe it was a shift in technology. Maybe it was a mentor. Maybe it was a book that you read. Or maybe you were just in the right place at the right time and had a special opportunity. Well, it turns out almost all initial advantages that lead to individual success, success and company success started with something random. That should give us all a lot of encouragement. You don't need a lot of money. You don't need a Harvard education like Bill Gates to get something going. You just need to be aware of this pattern and how it works. Let me give you a quick example. This rusty old piece of metal is displayed in a glass case at the Nike corporate headquarters like a precious museum piece. Can you guess what in the world this is and what it might, why it might be there? Turns out many years ago, there was a track coach who needed to find a new type of track shoe. Back then, teenage athletes literally had metal spikes on the bottom of their shoes. Sounds like a toxic combination, metal spikes and teenagers. He was sitting at breakfast one day and he watched his wife pull a waffle out of a waffle iron. Without saying a word, he ran back to the high school chemistry lab, got some latex, poured it into the waffle iron, 
pulled it out and said, this could be the bottom of a shoe. And that's how Nike got started. And this is that beat up old waffle iron. When you start to see these patterns, when you start to listen to the most successful people and the most successful businesses, you'll almost always find some sort of random event. Now, but that's not all. That doesn't create advantage in its own. Just having an idea, just having a vision, just you know, being in the right place at the right time, that doesn't create momentum. You have to combine it with an opportunity in the marketplace. I call this a seam. Now, back when I was a young guy in business, a strategy was a 250-page document and a five-year plan. Today, a strategy is about connecting this advantage that you have, whatever it might be. Maybe you're a great writer. Maybe you're great at podcasting. Maybe you're great at market research. How do you combine that with some opportunity going on in the world today? Strategy today isn't about worrying about where you're going to be two years or three years from now. It's about speed and space and time. It's like American football. Now, you don't have to know anything about football to understand this, but the coaches on a football team are looking down on the field. The two teams are facing each other, strength against strength. And the coaches are seeing, is there anybody on the other side that's out of place? Are they tired? Are they overmatched? How can we burst through that opportunity and get as much gain as we can? That's what we're looking for today. That's why this idea of trend spotting is so important. This is the seam. This is the beginning of strategy. Applying our strengths as an individual or as a business or as a team to a seam of opportunity, an under-defended opportunity, a fracture in the status quo. Now, what I'd like to suggest today is the world we're living in today, this era of the pandemic, represents the largest fracture in the status quo in the history of the human race. There's more seams, more opportunities to burst through than I would say at any other time. March of 2020, when the pandemic was just breaking, I predicted we would have more startups in America than any other time in our history, and that came true. Sadly, we've had a lot of tragedy, right? We've had a lot of businesses fail, but we've actually had more startups than business failures. Let's start digging into some of these practicalities. This is why this time is so exciting. I contend we are entering the era of unintended consequences. There are so many changes going on with this pandemic now is a time of unprecedented opportunity if we're aware of our surroundings and we can apply these ideas to seams of opportunity. Let me tell you a little bit more of what I mean. When we went into the pandemic, we guessed wrong on almost everything. We did not have a very good crystal ball. Who could have predicted we would run out of lumber? We would run out of mulch. The store shelves would be empty of Clearasil because people's faces were breaking out because of the masks. We would have shortages of homes. Our home prices would soar. In the middle of a global health crisis, in a recession, all this stuff would be happening. So it just proves we didn't really know what would happen. There were a lot of unintended consequences. And here's the interesting thing. We're also going to be guessing wrong on almost everything coming out of the pandemic. Let me give you just two small examples. Before the pandemic, about 20% of Americans said they suffered from chronic sleep problems. Can you guess what it is today? Kind of a mind-blowing number. 60%. They're calling this Corona somnia. People have different work habits, different sleep habits. They're consuming content in different ways. Um, everything's just sort of out of whack. They've had this accumulated stress. 
you know, grief and anxiety and disorientation around the pandemic. So what does this mean when 60% of your customers are irritable and stressed out? 60% of your employees are irritable and stressed out. What's going to happen to long-term health consequences? Here's another thing that's new. 18% of consumers are ready to switch brands if a brand can say or convince a consumer that they're safer and cleaner. Now, these are just two little changes that have happened during the pandemic. Think of all the millions of changes that you're, that you're hearing about. New ways to work, new places to work, new ways to learn, to teach, to date, to connect, to eat, even to work out. I talked to a brand manager at Adidas, or if you're from Europe, Adidas, and he told me that the pandemic has redefined sport. So all these pressures, all these changes are changing our consumers, our customers. They're creating new opportunities, new seams for you. So let's now talk about how do we pay attention? How do we find these seams? A few years ago, I got to meet and interview one of my literary heroes, Walter Isaacson. He's written books about Steve Jobs and Albert Einstein and Leonardo da Vinci. He kind of studies geniuses. And I said, what is this, this, this talent? What is this gift? What makes genius? And he said, the insight of genius requires two things, endless curiosity and the ability to see patterns. So that's why we need to be constantly right now connected to our customers. Can we, can we be curious about what's going on and detect new patterns in our customers. Number two, when I was doing the research for the book, I kept seeing this over and over again, that oftentimes great insight and innovation comes, these sparks of initial advantage come when you bump into something you weren't really looking for. So all of us are reading every day, we're researching every day. Whenever you see something you don't expect, do you stop and explore more? That could be a new insight. That could be a new opportunity, a new seam for you. Here is, uh, actually, I think I jumped ahead here. Okay, I did jump ahead here. So, uh, actually, I'm going to go here first. So, another really interesting idea. When I was back in the <clears throat> corporate world, I worked for a big manufacturing company. And there's ja this Japanese term called Gemba. If you really want to know what's going on, you can't just sit in your office. You need to get out where the action is. You need to look around to get new ideas. We used to call it going to Gemba. Now, one of the challenges we have today is that a lot of us are isolated, we're locked in, we're not going to conferences, we're not seeing people like we used to. How do we go to Gemba when we're sitting in our, in our offices like I am here today from Knoxville, Tennessee? And one of the ideas, here's something that I've been doing, uh, it's, it's this thing called Lunch Club. You can sign up and meet other marketers who uh, have similar interests to you and I've met random people and we just start talking about what are you looking at? What are you studying? What are you interested in? And uh, it's been a good way to sort of network and go to Gemba even when I'm locked into my office. So I'm worried about innovation and serendipity uh, is really lacking right now. We're going to have to almost schedule time to create these new random events that lead to opportunity and momentum. Now, when the pandemic hit last year, I got sick. My wife got coronavirus on a family ski trip. She brought it home to me. We were both sick. Between the sickness and being quarantined, I had to stay in my house for eight weeks. 
there was no way for us to get food. So we, we subscribed to HelloFresh. Maybe some of you have heard about this. They deliver fresh groceries and recipes to your doorstep. We liked it so much. We've continued even after the crisis. Think how profound this is. A portion of my food budget is going to a distribution channel I didn't even know existed in January of 2020. That is momentum, right? That is finding a seam. HelloFresh had the right idea at the right time. Opportunities come through crisis. Every crisis creates underserved and unmet customer needs. And finally, this is one of my favorite ideas. I was so, uh, so lucky, so fortunate in my life. I got to study under the great business um, consultant and writer, Peter Drucker. He was my teacher and mentor for three years. And one of my favorite sayings, he would teach us by the Harvard case study method. And he'd, he'd have us study these case studies and he would ask us, is the dog barking? And what he meant by that, if we're reading a case study and we expect something to happen, but it didn't happen, if we think the dog should be barking, but the dog isn't barking, stop right there. That is an opportunity. Let me give you a quick idea of what I mean by that. In 2012, Hallmark Greeting Cards announced that they were getting into the e-card business. Makes perfect sense, right? Then, a few weeks ago, I saw this headline in the Wall Street Journal. Farewell, Dancing Snoopy. Hallmark ends digital cards. That makes no sense. The whole world is moving to e-commerce. Why would the biggest greeting card company in the world stop? It doesn't make sense. The dog isn't barking. So I dug down and here's what I found. There are two major demographics for greeting cards. Number one, senior citizens. No surprise there, right? But they don't like sending cards over computers. The second big demographic is Gen Z. Turns out young kids love greeting cards, but they don't want computer cards. They want handcrafted, handmade artisanal cards. That's a seam. If I'm an artist that loves making cre uh, handmade cards, I'm gonna start a TikTok channel and start teaching people how I make these cards and start a new business, right? The dog, in this article, the dog wasn't barking and I dove down and found a new opportunity for someone. So here's the lesson. Let's sum all this up. Today, the greatest soft skill, I think marketers, PR professionals, communicators, salespeople can have, is to be humble. Everything that we thought about our customers, about our, our audience, has been changing and is gonna to continue to change. So we need to be alert. We need to be connected. We need to listen. We need to go down rabbit holes. If we are investigating something and we see something we didn't expect, if the dog isn't barking, if we see new patterns, we need to stop, we need to listen. And here's something else. I am not paying attention to any research that was conducted before March of 2020. The pandemic isn't a blip. It wasn't an aberration. I hope what you're starting to learn today is that this was a reset. We're in a new era of unintended consequences. We can't predict what might happen in the future based on data points from 2019. Every new, every chart we see, every new piece of research that we use for our businesses has to begin in March, 2020. So as I promised, here are a couple interesting trends that I'm watching, right? These are things that I think are opportunities for communicators and marketers today. I think they represent new themes. Number one, 
55% of online shoppers surveyed in the U.S. say they purchase products because they come across them unexpectedly. These are impulse buys. Now think about the implications for marketing. If you, if 55% if of your customers are making impulse buys, is there a sales funnel? Is there lead nurturing? This would suggest probably not. Here's another one. 42% of consumers surveyed in the U.S. get ideas on which products to shop from for celebrities and creators. Let's use another word for that. Influencers. And an influencer isn't necessarily a teenager in baggy jeans selling energy drinks. It could be your neighbor. The research shows that trust in businesses, brands, and advertising has declined 13 years in a row. Who do people trust? Each other. They trust their neighbors. They trust these people they see online called influencers. Research shows that the young generation today, the number one reason they go on social media every day is to see what their favorite creator or influencer has posted that day. This is a whole new trend that's going to be continuing to grow uh, dramatically. This is something else that's that's really, really interesting that you know, I don't really know what the implications are, but it's an opportunity. People don't want to go into sales anymore. The pay is going up. The job opportunities are going up. But what's going what's going on here? People aren't going into sales. Do, is one of your competencies sales? Is one of your competencies sales training? Are people going to have to sell in new ways. Do you have a competency around e-commerce? If we can't have regular salespeople anymore, even though salaries are going up, job openings are going up, what are the new solutions? What is there a seam here for you? A final idea I want to just throw out there today. And again, I'm just giving you the tip of the iceberg. I really encourage you to pay attention to all these shifts. They're all opportunities for you. This is the greatest time of business opportunity in the history of our country. And that, you know, and I think that, that that's fair for everyone. So one more idea. It's this idea of, e of live commerce. This is something that started in China during the pandemic. People couldn't go to uh, shop in stores. So these stores started having live streaming events with influencers that took advantage of impulse buying. Think about this. It's bringing all of these trends together, live streaming, live engagement, influencers, an opportunity to see your favorite influencer celebrity, you know, right there. And impulse buying. We just talked about how there's a, this amazing surge, right, in impulse buying. Uh, last week, there was an article that showed there was an influencer in China that did a live streaming event where you could buy impulse buys right away. He was a very popular uh, young man in China. He was selling goods for a retail organization there. He sold. Five billion dollars in goods in one day. Mind blowing. It's a new way to think about retail, right? It's a new way to think about selling. Is this, this is starting to creep into America. Is this a seam for you? Now, here's the last idea that I want to bring to you to kind of illustrate how big this is, how grand this is for you. Maybe you've heard over the years in, uh, in classic uh, marketing uh, literature, there's this thing called the seven portals. So most customers are creatures of habit. They buy the same thing day after day, week after week, the same brand of beer, the same car, the same breakfast cereal, except the seven times in their life 
when there are big life changes, when you leave home, when you get married, when you have a child, you're open to new ideas, new products, new services. The pandemic is the eighth portal. This is how significant it is. It's historically important. 81% of consumers said they've changed their shopping habits since the start of the pandemic. 92% said they're gonna continue buying in these new ways. So what does that mean for you? As I said, this is a historically important time and a historically important opportunity for marketers for communications professionals. So I will now uh, turn it back to Marianne and we'll take a few questions. I just wanted to thank you. If you wanna learn more about me, my blog, I have a podcast called The Marketing Companion. You can find all my social media connections at businessesgrow.com and I follow everybody back on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today. Hey, Mark, thank you so much. That was awesome. Really thank you. Excited, really excited to uh, to have you here with us today. Um, we have a few questions for you. Uh, the, uh, the the I think the, the favorite part uh, that I had of your presentation was uh, the eighth portal. Um, fascinating, right, uh, to think about that. And, and that just leads to uh, thinking in my mind of Facebook and, and the direction, you know, that they're going with the, with the metaverse. Um, I really had mixed feelings as, as a marketer myself, you know, when I heard that they were changing their name to Meta. Um, and i just curious, you know, as a futurist um, and somebody who just, you know, is really tuned into to trends, you know, what, what do you think um, B2B marketers should be looking for and watching, you know, as it evolves, um, as the metaverse becomes a, more of a commercial entity, um, opportunities for marketing, advertising, and, and, and investment overall? I would be a fast follower. <laughs> um, if you think about any major innovation, the first one doesn't work. So, you know, what was the product that really transformed Apple? It was the iPod. You could carry, you know, a thousand songs in your pocket. They weren't the first MP3 player. They weren't the third MP3 player, right? But they became the best MP3 player and they built on the mistakes of others. There's going to be more than one metaverse, right? There's going to be one, more than one in integration of all this technology. Um, you know, I, I think we need to learn. We need to, to really pay attention in the way I talked about today. We need to look at seams and opportunities. And if it fits where we are, we need to burst through those. But I think something new and complicated like, like the metaverse, um, you know, I'll tell you, I, I've been involved in a lot of startups recently. And here's the phrase I'm getting really tired of hearing. We're building the plane while we're flying it. <laughs> <laughs> I hear that over and over and over. And that's just a really cool way of saying it doesn't work. <laughs> so, you know, I think, look, I'm a B2B marketer and um, I want to, I want to have a plan. I want to have a strategy. I want to place my bet on something that's going to work. So what I would do is, is, is just study, know enough to ask the right questions and be a fast follower. Super great advice. Um, you know, another issue that B2B marketers face um, day in and day out is uh, actually trying to reach their prospects, right? With the pandemic, it's become more and more difficult. Um, I think you, know, you use the term um, reaching the unreachable. So um, what have you seen um, over the last couple of years? What sort of strategies um, or creative approaches to reaching the unreachable? Well, one of the things that, that, I, that I think is a really profound trend is that, as I mentioned in my presentation, people don't believe businesses advertising brands. 
they sort of roll their eyes and say, yeah, that's what we, yeah, uh, uh, well, we know you're green. Yeah, right. We know, you yeah, know, right. Oh, you've just, uh, you've just uh, promoted women in your business. Congratulations for being normal and doing the right thing, right? Now, they do believe people. They believe entrepreneurs. They believe business leaders. Increasingly, the personal brand is the brand, all right? We may not listen to an ad, but we'll listen to another person. And I think sort of an extreme example of this is Elon Musk. Now, Elon Musk, you know, love him or hate him, he's a real person and he, he acts like a real person. And he's beloved by many people because he's the greatest entrepreneur of our generation. Now, when Mercedes Benz sells a car, they spend on average $900 a car on advertising. Advertising, by the way, that people generally don't believe. Tesla spends $0 per car on advertising. They really do no advertising. And I think a lot of that equity comes from Elon Musk. We believe him. Now, again, that's an extreme example, and we all can't be Elon Musk. However, I do think there is a business case. And there's, there's a lot of answers to your question, by the way. And I cover a lot of this in a book I wrote called Marketing Rebellion. But I think one of the key ideas is that the personal brand increasingly is the brand. We want to know who are you? Who's running this company? What do you believe in? What do you stand for? How do you treat your employees? What's going to be happening next? We want to know. So that would be a key idea, I think, in terms of marketing strategy is how do we elevate business leaders to take a more important role in being the voice of their brand? Mm -hmm. That's that's great. Um, you know, we're a uh, cultivate communications is a is a content firm. Um, we uh, we help clients to identify opportunities to use content um, more effectively, you know, um, to support their brand, uh, to support lead generation. Um, more and more, uh, we're, we're, you know, in a situation where we're finding B2B, B2B clients of ours, um, they're in a me too world, right? Um, they're, uh, they're they're talking about their um their features and functionalities you know rather than um the the aspects of their brand that really help them to differentiate themselves um and so when it comes down to um really developing a, a content plan for a, a client we help them to think about um not just developing more and more content um, but we really want their content to be productive and do more, right? Uh, so from your perspective, um, I, I think we think alike there, right? You know, from a, from a content perspective, you know, um, why, why would this be important? Well, I have a saying that marketers flock to whatever is popular until they ruin it. And I think one of those things is, is content. A lot of people are creating content because they're afraid not to. They think this is the thing we need to do. Our competitors are doing it. And really, as you say, they're, they're kind of creating random acts of content. You really need to have a plan. You need to have a strategy. And great marketing is not about doing the same thing. It's not about conformity. It's about non-conformity. If you're just doing what your competitors are doing, you're just wasting money. You have to figure out a way to stand out in, in a distinctive way. And there are lots of ways to do that. There's almost limitless ways to do that. So I, I think creating content can't be checking a box. And, and, and especially even if you've been doing something for a long time, like you have a blog, or you have a podcast. If you think about what I talked about today, isn't this exactly the best time to think about a refresh? Are you really relevant today? If you're doing the same thing today that you were doing two years ago, I'm not sure 
you're going to be relevant. I just relaunched my podcast. I've had a podcast for nine years. And so I I've, I've have a completely new format. Uh, I think it's a better format. I think it's more connected to where people need to be today. So even me, I have a successful show. I've been doing it for nine years. I'm rethinking everything, right? Mm -hmm. I need to be, you know, if you're not relevant, you're going to be in decline. And so we need to be, I mean, the goal of a brand, when you get right down to it, is to be relentlessly relevant. Right. How, how are, just, just like I said in my presentation, don't worry about two years from now. How am I relevant right now? How do I apply my advantages, my gifts, my special talents to what the world needs in this moment and let the world take me where I need to go? Yeah, I think that's a great segue to your your latest uh, latest book. Um, yeah, talk a little bit more about what your inspiration was for cumulative advantage. Well, uh, writing a book is hard. <laughs> it's 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 really really hard work, and it's a big sacrifice. Um, like I said, it, it really takes uh, you know months and months of my life. I just lock myself into a room and. And uh, and become obsessed in in not a healthy way, mm -hmm. and so I've got to be sure that I'm solving a problem, and I think the problem cumulative advantage solves is that a, a, a lot of people are just feel stuck that that even being great isn't enough. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're doing your best work, you're doing great work, and you're still being buried. And I'm not the kind of person, you know, I'm a teacher. I teach at Rutgers University. I'm a consultant. I, I coach and, and, and mentor people. And I'm not the kind of person to say, oh, well, life is hard. We're all just going to be buried. Let's go move on. I, I want to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And that's what led me to this idea of momentum. If you reach a plateau, what's the strategy? How do you get, you know, if you don't have a million dollars in the bank, if you don't have this network from Harvard University, how do you get kick-started into this next level? And what I found is there is a pattern, mm -hmm. but it really hasn't been applied to real people and real businesses before because it's all been stuck in academic research. So that's what this book is about. It's a, it's a pattern. And my prediction is once you read this book and you see this pattern, you'll never see the world the same way again. Because when you start reading stories about successful people, you'll think about these five steps that I have in the book. You'll say, yep, there it is. There it is. Yep, that's the pattern Mark talked about. So it's just a matter of let's understand how momentum works and then be strategic about it and say, how do I make this work mm -hmm. for me? Yeah, great. Yeah, very, very insightful. Um, well, thank you so much for your time today and for, for sharing um, all of your your uh, great uh, thoughts around trends and trend spotting. Um, I definitely will be thinking about, you know, uh, trends differently after hearing your talk today. Well, thank you. My job is done here. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure. Have a have a great day, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye. -bye.